بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى صحابته البر الميامين والتابعين وتابع التابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم ما بعد فاسم فرمو السلام الله عليكم ورحمته وبركاته uh, We will continue إن شاء الله تعالى with the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Let's put, let's put it here. It's better, right? Yeah, yeah. And we left off last session. Anyone remember where we left off? What did we mention last session? After the boycott. Good. Some of the things we mentioned with regards to the boycott. It's just my voice. Take longer. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Uh, good. Yeah. Any significant events that happened during that time? Oh, the passing of is it the passing of uh, the uncle, his uncle. And What's his name? Which uncle? Is it Abu Talib? Abu Talib. Good. And the passing of uh, Khadija. Khadija radiallahu anha. Good. And what was that, anyone else, and what was that year known as? Year of sorrow. The year of? Sorrow. Sorrow. the year of grief. Now, good. Amr al-Husn became, it's not like a, a hadith or the Prophet said himself, this is the year of, no. It's just that in the books of history or the, or the scholars, they refer to this year as the year of sorrow, Amr al-Husn. <clears throat> because it affected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A lot. طيب. And we ended at the fact that things became even more difficult on the Prophet ﷺ because now he has no uh, support. Abu Talib was the one who protected him after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, of course. But he was the one who protected the Prophet ﷺ from the evil of Quraysh. Uh, however, I mean, the plan was, I know he was announced as uh, the topic was supposed to be Hijrah today. However, uh, of course, asking the permission of the, the, the brothers in charge, uh, I wanted to tackle a few things that happened prior to Hijrah. Before, at Hijrah, that are relevant towards Qaylan today, especially after what happened last night. A few lessons that we can take from some of the events that happened just before Hijrah, just before the migration of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina. The first thing we wanted to uh, highlight or mention was something that happened on the 10th year of Prophethood. On the 10th year of Prophethood. So, quick maths, that's how many years before the Hijrah? Almost. Three years. Three years. Because, as we know, the Prophet ﷺ lived in Mecca for 13 years after prophethood, 13 years, and then moved to Medina and stayed there for 10 years. Give or take, because they count in lunar years, but give or take a little bit, you know, a couple of months. But roughly, you can say, what is known, uh, the number that is known is 13 years in Mecca after prophethood. And so if we say 10 years after prophethood, that is three years, again, give or take a few months, uh, Three years before Hijrah, before the Prophet وسلم, moving from Mecca to Al Medina. What happens at this time, or at this point, one of the things that happened at this point, at this time, the Prophet وسلم, decides to. That's right, body heat and all that, yeah? Keep it together. 
بارك الله فيكم The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decides to travel to Ta'if travel to a city called Ta'if which is about 80 kilometers or so uh, from Mecca but at that time you know straight roads and all paved and you know nice car air condition and all that, that it was by foot the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam traveled by foot and how old was the Prophet sallallahu again quick maths how old was the Prophet sallallahu this time 50 50 so look at give or take again but around that number 50 now you're walking 80 kilometers and it's not again like you know just plain terrain look it's mountains mountains up and down up and down at the age of 50 the Prophet sallallahu is taken on this journey why quick question why do we think that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Went to why specifically Taif? Guess why? Was it the final place for Hijra? Could have been, but there are a few main reasons why the Prophet وسلم, I mean, at this time, by the way, there was no concept of Hijra. The Prophet had not been told that he needs to move out in the sense of in the concept of Hijra in that sense. But something along those lines. Yes, but yes, so he's traveling, he's going there to call them to Islam. He's there, he's going to Taif to, te to tell them about Islam because they weren't, the Islam had not, as the Prophet had never been there, so Islam had not really, really reached that far. But he went specifically to Taif. There's, there's a few reasons why he went specifically to Taif as opposed to other smaller towns or cities. Is it the next biggest tribe? Yeah. Thaqif, Banu Thaqif. After Quraysh, or after Mecca, this city was, you can say, the second largest city, or the, the second, uh, you know, most powerful city in that sense. It was a hub. After, after Mecca, it was Ta'if, because it was ruled by this, this tribe known as uh, Thaqif. Okay? Uh, it was a big rivalry, by the way, between Quraysh and, and uh, this tribe Thaqif. Okay, because it was like a power struggle in that sense. So Mecca was known as the hub, but after Mecca, it would be Taif. So in terms of power or influence, the Prophet ﷺ, again, his own ishtihad, he's thinking, if Quraysh is not going to believe in me, fine, you know, I'll go find someone else. Or find another group of people who have power and influence. If I can get the da'wah to them and they become Muslim, that could be... Uh, uh, you know, a boost for the da'wah to la ilaha illallah. Another reason. This is more sort of personal to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You have relatives there. Yeah. Yes. N no. Something along the lines of relation. Leave a tricky one. This one. Halima Saadiyah. Remember that person? The one who breastfed the Prophet وسلم, she was from Thaqif, she was from this tribe, Banu Thaqif. Okay? So, extended, from an extended point of view, the Prophet وسلم, had family in that sense. From the, because he was the, you know, she was his mother in, in terms of uh, suckling or, you know, breastfeeding in that sense. Okay? So, through her, the Prophet وسلم, had relatives in that sense. So, he could have used that as support mechanism he comes to Taif and said look my mother in, in, in Rada'a or in, 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 in suckling is Halima and so on that's a known person so you know I, that's his way in kind of thing right so those are the kind of two reasons amongst others of course but these are kind of the two main reasons that some of the scholars mentioned why the Prophet وسلم, specifically went to uh, Taif and with him the Prophet وسلم, uh, with him is a person called Zayd, Zayd ibn Haritha. We've mentioned this person before. How is he related to the Prophet? Yeah, he loosely we can say in English adopted son. However, the Prophet was told that he was not allowed to uh, adopt like that. Okay, because it became a thing. The Prophet even 
or the, uh, Zayd even took the Prophet's name. He became known as Zayd ibn Muhammad, Zayd the son of Muhammad. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down ayah uh, in which he says, Jalla wa ala ud'uhum li'aba'ihim. Name them after their fathers. Okay? So he got his real name, which is Zayd ibn Haritha. But yes, he was seen as almost the son of the Prophet sallallahu He was actually the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? But, I mean, we've mentioned this story before, but he decided to stay, even though his parents or his father and uncle came from Yemen to, you know, uh, to take him back home. Zayd said, no, I'm staying. He hasn't seen his family, mother and father, for, I don't know how many years, but he decided, no, I'm staying with Muhammad. He sacrificed staying with his own family because he loved the Prophet sallallahu more than, I mean, he would prefer to stay with the Prophet sallallahu more than he would, he wanted to go back and live with his own family. Okay? So a very, very close relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And so he traveled with him. And just to give you a, a kind of like a, a taste of what's going to happen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, later on, after this event, when he came back to Mecca, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, later basically, years later, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, or a while after this incident, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Aisha radiallahu anha, asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was the most difficult day for you, Ya Rasulullah, in terms of your da'wah? And he said, this day, he referred to the day of uh, his journey to Ta'if. Okay, so the most difficult day for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in terms of him delivering his da'wah. Bear in mind, he has faced a lot of harm from Quraysh already. He has seen his companions, be, you know, tortured, some killed. طيب. Of course, it's going to be very difficult on the Prophet Boycott. We just covered that last session. A very difficult time. His uncle passes away, Khadija, a lot of things. But yet, he says, this day was the most difficult day for him sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And we will see why. But I want you to really, you know, focus on this matter throughout the story that I'm mentioning, the story of Taif. This is the most difficult day for the Prophet Sallallahu Okay? Keep this in mind. Because then we will see how the Prophet Sallallahu reacted. Right? He is telling us, this is the most difficult day for me. As a Prophet, Messenger of Allah, the most difficult day. But then we will see how he reacted Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's a reason why I'm mentioning this and I'm highlighting this story as well as uh, another story that I will mention, something that happens, an event, I shouldn't call it a story because that sounds like some fairy tales, an event that happened, okay, after this, uh, about a year after it, why I'm, I'm mentioning these two specifically, there are other things that happened, but I'm mentioning, I'm mentioning these two specifically because they are related to what's going on today, right? and what's happened, uh, you know, this past few weeks. <coughs> So the Prophet وسلم, again says to us that this is the most difficult day. This was the most difficult day for me. He travels وسلم, with Zayd ibn Haritha. And he enters into Taif. And he approaches, if you want to call it, the, the, the chiefs of Thaqif, okay, of this tribe, who's in charge of the city. Three, uh, two of them are brothers, the other one is not. These are top chiefs, if you want to call it, the dons of the city, approaches them and delivers the message. And he's a prophet of Allah, etc. He gives them the message. And they couldn't care less. One of the things they say is, all right, fine. Either you're telling the truth and you're a prophet, and if that was true, you'd be too good for us. Like, you're too good. Yeah, for us, yeah, in the sense, for you to talk to us, even like we, we're nothing. You're up there, you, you know. You're too good to even speak to us. Or you're a liar. You're not a prophet. Then you would be too. Uh, you would be nothing and too low for us to listen to. I need like it or like it. I need just خلاص. Hey, خلاص. That's it. So they haven't. There's neither that or that. They've just left it like that. You know. Yani, we're not going to listen to you. Even if you're telling the truth, truth, or if you're lying, Allah, it doesn't matter to us. So this is very difficult. Now the Prophet is like, oh, like, at least, you know, take the message or not, at least reject or take it. But no, they, and then they start to humiliate him, even, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So even, like, really humiliate him. So now he's being verbally abused. Verbally abused. 
And then the Prophet, this, this is how far it goes. The Prophet then says to them, all right, fine. Now, you're not going to believe me? At least, you know, at least keep it between us. At least keep it between us. Right? Okay, you say whatever you want <coughs> to me, but let, just, just keep that between us. They don't even honor that. Right? What they do instead is they tell the, kid, the children and the kids and, 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 and the women and people on the streets and people who are sort of have mental disabilities and so on to, you know, take rocks and stones and throw at him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so now he's also physically abused. For what? Hey, he didn't do anything wrong. He did nothing wrong. All he said was, look, I am a prophet. If you want to take this, if you want to take it, at least let me go in peace. I, it's just a quick message. But no. They verbally abuse him and then also physically abuse him. Imagine the, the, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam feels. It's not, it's not nice, is it? Right? And not just that. I mean, that's between them and you know, behind closed doors. He's been, all right, fine. He'll deal with that later. He walks out. Now he's being phys physically abused as well. Stones thrown out. Zayd even says, I tried to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I tried to cover him and take. It became too much even that. I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't handle it. That, that's how much it was. But it, until he finally reaches a place. After running away from these people. And they, I mean, kids now, mashallah, they have energy. So anyone who has kids, you will know. Huh? And they have a lot of energy. So it's not a couple of throws and oh, I'm tired now. La, he will continue. He will carry on. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Kids have a lot of energy. Huh? You will be surprised sometimes. Like, where do they get this energy from? You wake up, it takes you 20 minutes to get out of bed. So, how are you? It takes you a while to get out of bed. You got to stretch, you run a couple of times, look at your phone. It takes a while. A kid wakes up, boom, out straight, running around. And jump on you. Trying to get you excited as well. You ain't got no time for that. <laughs> but, but they, mashallah, they got energy. And it's like the whole day. You're knack at the end of the day, and they're still running. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And so, imagine that in this scenario here. The kids are running after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same, because they have energy. So the Prophet you're trying to get, out, get away from them. But they're after him, and throwing at him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, look at, look at the degradation there as well. Look at how much they're humiliating him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, imagine this. The most difficult day upon the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now he finally reaches sort of like a piece of land. A piece of land that is owned by two people from Mecca. Two brothers. Utba and Shayb ibn Rabi'ah. Enemies of the Prophet wasallam. They hate the Prophet wasallam. And this is another a little, uh, you know, uh, how do I put it? You know, some, this is a funny aspect here as well. Uh, be ironic really they are enemies of the prophet but they have a place there okay a piece of land you know it's walled and everything like that he gets there now shayba and utbah they're from mecca muhammad sallam is from mecca from Quraysh, the same same people and so they protect him even though they're enemies they hate them they hate the prophet but they are like well we're people from mecca Quraysh. these people are from Thaqif, another tribe they're not going to beat one of our people. Even though they hate him. But look how what tribe does. Tribalism. Even though they hate him. They hate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But because of this, uh, the izzah they have, the pride in their, in their uh, qabila, in their tribe, in the nationality, they would prefer that. Another thing is what we mentioned earlier. One of the reasons from the scholars is say that one of the reasons why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, keep it between us Whatever you did to me and whatever your response is, just keep it between me and you. Don't tell nobody. One of the reasons the scholars mentioned why the Prophet ﷺ said this was so that it doesn't spread to Mecca. So that people of Mecca don't find out that this is what the people of Thaqif, huh, this tribe did to our guy, even though <laughs> they're going to assassinate him. They hate him. They want to kill him. But when they hear, oh, another tribe hit one of our people, there will be war. <coughs> there will be beef. There will be beef. That's how, you know, ignorant these people are. I mean, it worked for our favor, protected the Prophet, so he worked for our favor in this sense. But 
that also shows the 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 level of wala and the level of uh, what's the word wala in English alliance or allegiance sorry the level of allegiance they have to their tribe right and this unfortunately still exists today amongst Muslims amongst Muslims and I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about I don't have to give details yeah from my country it happens you know I'm sure in Bangladesh it happens in Pakistan it happens in Asia it happens uh, we have racism so I had a we have racism in our own like it sounds funny but we are racist towards one another people from the same country are racist towards one another you know we might not say it nah, religion deen all that stuff nonsense when it really comes huh when push comes to shove then you know then it shows then it's, it's seen okay a lot of you are youngsters you, you probably know what i'm talking about when it comes to marriage huh what's, what's the thing that you hear from from especially from the mothers ah, yo, she, mashallah, give me like, she's, she's, she's light skin huh Look at the boys now Sarah, she's light skin she's beautiful that's what you hear so what is that dark skin yani she's not she's not beautiful yani because she's dark skin. what kind of nonsense is this or uh, I don't uh, pick, but you have beef between people like people from this city and that city. Huh? That can select. You have beef. So, it exists. Why? Uh, well, Muslim. And I'm not saying just Bangladesh, it happens in my country as well. Beef, because oh, historically, because you this, some next guy did this, and it's your tribe, and against our tribe, you guys. And then, a hundred years later, it's still going on. I mean, why? Something happened like hundred years ago, 70, 50, 60, whatever. We are Muslims at the end of the day. Because then what happens? What we see today. When we start to differ like this, he's from that tribe, he's from this city, I'm from this city, they're stupid, or they're a law because they are sort of handyman, they're workers, and we are businessmen, we are, you know, we trade and stuff like that, and we, you know, they are stupid, you know, Bedouins, uh, junglies, they don't understand, huh? Uh, we are civilized, but it, this animosity. Animosity happens. And we are Muslim. People say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What happens then? What we see today. Kuffar, non Muslims, other nations, they will look at us and laugh. All of you are uncivilized. Uh, you, you call yourself civilized in the other city, not civilized. No, no. All of, they look at us and think, all of you guys are civilized. Uncivilized. And that's how they treat us, like uncivilized. And that's what we see. This word that always coming up nowadays in, in the news dehumanization. We're not, as Muslims, we're not worth anything anymore. The blood of a Muslim is the cheapest blood. Cheaper than insects. So you have human rights and all sorts of rights. rights. But there's not such thing as, 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 as Muslim rights. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're fighting over all sorts now. Huh? Veganism, all what's happening with this and, and uh, what they say about uh, avocados and the carbon footprint and the arguing and the discussion about all of this type of stuff and Muslims are dying left, right and center it's not, it doesn't nobody bats an eyelid that's how cheap our blood is why? the Prophet has already told us very simply the Prophet said in a hadith يُوشِكُ أَن تَتَدَى عَلَيْكُمُ الْأُمَمْ and we don't want to go into this too much because I'm sure every khutbah for the past few weeks have been regarding this topic if not in this message all other, you know, many other massages. Right? The Prophet وسلم, said, There will come a time when nations will gather upon you like the people gather upon a plate of food, a meal. Okay? And the Prophet said, They will call one another. Tamam, you know, when you have a meal at home, you invite people to, Come, come. The guy says, oh, No, I'm full, I'm all right. No, 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 no. Come sit down, you pull him down. Sorry? Just come eat like that. That's how they're going to gather upon us as Muslims, as a nation, as an ummah. Hey, we'll share. Come, you come now. You take this piece. Uh, we'll, we'll take this one. You guys, you come here. You have this Palestine. It's yours. Don't worry. Hey, take it. It's yours. Who are you to give it in the first place? Huh? We'll give it like that. Anyway, we're not going to get cancelled. <laughs> Love is that. But, and so, this is what we see today. That's what we see. Nations are gathering upon us as Muslims. Why? The Prophet said in the hadith, in this, in this hadith, he told us why. Because the Prophet said at the end, 
because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies. And they don't fear us anymore as an ummah, as Muslims. We don't mean nothing. And what? what? What are they going to do? And that's what we see. Bombarding and What? What are you going to do? That's what you hear from their, their leaders. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy them. Huh? What? Who's going to stop us? Who are you? And everybody, sorry. That's what happens. Sorry? That's what we see. The Prophet has already said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies. From your hearts, from the hearts of your enemies. Not just that, not just that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in your hearts, in your hearts, wahan. And that's what the Prophet, then this companion says, What's wahan, ya Rasulullah? What is this word? He said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hubbu dunya wa karahiya tul maut. What's the yeah? Yeah? Oh, it's coming. Apologies again for technical. Yeah, it's fun. Illuminati and all that, yes, we're still. <laughs> yeah, they heard us. Conspiracies, yeah? Well, I'm just trying. No, no, hold it. It's easy. The Prophet says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in your hearts wahm. And they ask, Ya Rasulullah, what is wahm? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hubbud Dunya wa Karahiyatul Maut. The love for dunya and the hate for death. The love for dunya and the hate for death. Now, no Muslim is going to say, No, no, come on, I don't, I don't love the dunya. Dunya, and he will give you some, some hadith and some ayat that they memorized. No, it's not about words. Action, like they said in English, actions speak louder than words. It's because how we prioritize. How we prioritize as Muslims on an individual basis and collectively as well. And collectively as well. Where are your priorities? Right? Where are your priorities? That's something we have to, I mean, we've mentioned this in previous khutab and so on and so forth many times. Right? But very, you know, just to give one example. One example. We find Amongst Muslims, many Muslims, unfortunately, fighting one another over football teams. Sahara, look at Tottenham fans and Arsenal fans now, for example. Yeah? yeah. You guys really watch, you watch your football, sir? You don't watch football? MashaAllah. Good. Alhamdulillah. If you don't, good. If you do, you know. Huh? You know the beef between Arsenal fans and Tottenham fans. I hate you. Sometimes between brothers and in some same family there'll be beef. Huh? Or United fans and City fans. Beef. No, oh, Manchester is blue. No, oh, Manchester is red. Uh, and then they have arguments. And they start talking about stats and football players. And they know more about certain players huh, than, subhanAllah, than they know about their own family. So they know more about the, that football player, specific football. They know everything about his history, where he grew up, which academy he went to, which campus he used when he was a baby. They ask him, what's the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, he thinks Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is part of his name. Ah, as far as it goes. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is our room. This, this is here, okay, this is in the UK. Back home, Barcelona, Real Madrid. Barcelona, Real Madrid. And that's it, as if those are the only, only teams in the whole world, by the way. They don't, they don't understand Spanish. They, don't, they just know Barca, Barca and Real Madrid. That's it. And you have to, the Qiyama happens if they, if they say something. Major beef. 
That's it. What was this? This is the state of our ummah. This is the state of our ummah. And that is why we're in the state that we are in. This is the state, I mean, we're not here pointing fingers, saying, oh, uh, the rulers and they're not doing anything. No. Allah has put them there for a reason. Allah has put them there because that's what we deserve. We deserve people like this. You know, one day, a man came to Ali radiallahu anhu in, in, in Iraq when he was a, when he was a leader. And he would, a man came complaining. The time of the Prophet, anyone like this, and you are a leader of us now. What you did? And he was blaming Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Saying that he's not a fair leader. And, uh, at the time of the Prophet, they weren't like this. They, these leaders, Abu Bakr and Uthman, they weren't like this. <laughs> Ali radiallahu anhu turned to him and said, You know why? Because Abu Bakr and Umar, they were leaders over people like me. Huh? They were lead leaders over people like me. That's why they were the way they were. Whereas now, for people like you, Allah put, me, put someone like me to deal with you, sort you out. So, the lesson here is so Allah puts these people to teach us a lesson. To teach us a lesson. Right? If we were on point, Allah would remove these people and place better people over us as leaders. Right? So it's a lesson for us. Say, lesson for us. For us as individuals, like I said, because we have an individual responsibility as well towards the greater ummah. And we have a collective responsibility as well. So families, because like the ummah is made up of societies, right? Across the nation. Each society is comprised by what? Different communities. So, and every community is built by families. Yeah? And families are built by individuals. That's how you work it out. Start with yourself as individuals, go wider in your family, extended family, the community, and then the community will expand, and then society will also be rectified. And then at large, inshallah ta'ala, the ummah will be rectified as well. SubhanAllah, was a we digressed it quite a lot, subhanAllah. Uh, alhamdulillah, it was good because we, that's the point of these stories that we take lessons from it. And we learn, we'll take from it lessons that we can apply in today's. Uh, day and age. Al Muhim. Al Muhim. So the Prophet وسلم, reaches this place. Uh, this is a land owned by Utbah and Rabi'ah. Uh, Utbah and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah. And he makes a dua. Now, again, <coughs> bear in mind the Prophet وسلم, has done nothing wrong. So nothing wrong. He came to deliver a message. He came to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did it in the best possible way. Because that's what we believe in in terms of the Prophet sallallahu He was perfect in terms of his delivering of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now, what does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? And this is for us a lesson, ikhwani. When things don't go your way, don't point fingers. Don't look at everyone else. When things become difficult, when you're in a time of distress, when you're in a time, in time of calamity, when you are in times of weakness, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. He says, it's been narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at this point, when he finally finds refuge, they've gone and they've left him now. Bear in mind, he's in a, he's in a state. He's in a state. Blooded up and all. He's in a state. He turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and makes dua. And he says what our Shaykh said, our Imam said in, in the Qunut that we did in the Salah Jazah al The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allahumma ilayka ashku ba'fa quwati. Oh Allah, oh Allah, I complain to you, not about them, oh Allah, deal with them. Deal with them. He said, oh Allah, I complain to you of my weakness. 
of my weakness. Of my weakness. Maybe there was some, I, I have no power, I was trying, I couldn't do it. Maybe there's something that I did that was wrong. Waqillah tahirati and lack of my own means. I don't have power, I don't have strength. So, oh Allah, I complain to you of this. Wahawani ala nas. And how, you know, my, 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 weak, my weakness or, uh, you know, my status amongst people in the sense that I don't have that much say in the sense that I'm weak. طيب. And so the Prophet ﷺ is complaining to Allah subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala. And this is what we see across the board with all the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When things become difficult, they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya'qub alayhi salam, we covered this in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. What did Ya'qub alayhi salam do? Even though he knew that there is something about this story that his, this, this, his sons are saying, it doesn't add up. He, he could have just straight away, no, no, you guys are lying, come here and you deal with them. No. Rather, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And he says, إِنَّمَا يَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ I complain of my sorrow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my grief and my sorrow. And we see this across the board, as I said, throughout the lives of the prophets, alayhim salam. And then he says, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, and most merciful, those who have mercy. Anta Rabbul Mustadrafin, you are the Lord of the of the weak. Wa anta Rabbi and you are my Lord. Ila man takiluni to who or to whom do you leave me? Ila Baidin Yetajahamuni. Someone far. People in the some of the first uh Quraysh. You uh transgress upon me or you know, uh, show animosity or oppression over me. Am ila adu in malakta hu amri or an enemy whom you have given or, you know, my affairs are in, you know, uh, in their hands or they have power over me in that sense. The key thing is here what he says after this. Or, uh, you know, a line that we should underline. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in lam yakun bika alayya ghadabun. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as long as you're not upset or you're not angry with me, I don't mind. Anything can happen. Let them do whatever they want to me. As long as you, O oh Allah, you're not angry with me, I'm happy. I, I will handle it, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. As long as you're not angry with me, I will. Ah, it's a lesson for us here, Ikhwan. A lesson for us here. What you're going through. Remember, the most important thing is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us in a hadith, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ إِبْتِلَاءً Those who are the most and the most severe in terms of trials and tribulations and calamities, etc. So not just quantity, but also, you know, in terms of the severity of the tests and trials are the prophets and then they're like and they're like meaning the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more you will be tested and the more difficult your tests will be but what did we say in the in the beginning those are the prophets and who is more nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than prophets nobody so that is the, the, the focal point. That is the focal point. Your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That is the most and the vital point that we take. Okay? Things will happen to us as an ummah. Difficult because this is prophecies of the Prophet. It's already told us what will happen. Whatever we are seeing today, the Prophet has already told us will happen. These atrocities that we are seeing, the Prophet has told us already. That this is going to happen to you as an ummah. But the key thing here is when, and the Prophet already told us the victory will come, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already told us the victory will come. He says, Well, aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The end, the victory will be for al muttaqeen. Those who are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have taqwa. So that is the lesson from this ikhwan your relationship and your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not angry with you. That is the lesson in Gwani. 
And then he mentions Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam other things as well and glorifies Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and seeks refuge with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from evil of the day and the night. And he asks Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to uh, rectify his dunya and, in the, and his akhirah, uh, etc. And then at the end he says, وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِكَ also a major, you know, uh, or a very, very important point that Allah, the Prophet ﷺ mentions here. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِكَ There is no might nor power except with you, Ya Allah. Meaning you, as a Muslim, can't do anything. Forget Muslim. You as a creation can't do anything except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You breathing is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You take a step, and this is how, Ikhwani, we really have to think about it. It's easy to say, Allah yeah, that's it. yeah, it's a nice statement. Tayyip, sounds like, if you're not Arab, it sounds like you speak Arabic now, mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, no, it's more. You have to understand the, 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 the magnitude of the statement. When you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah, this we say, for example, when we're leaving our house, Bismillah, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. But it's just, sometimes it's just, it's just lip service, you know, it's muscle memory. I mean, just say it and you go. Don't really think about it and, and ponder over what it means. When you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah, you are saying, right? you are saying, you can't do anything except by the permission of Allah. Except by the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing you to do it. That is the reality. That is the reality. You are not here because, mashallah, you're righteous and, you know, you... La, Allah brought you here. You're not special in that sense. You're not better than anybody else. Those people who are on the road. People who are not Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you. It's not you by yourself. Yeah, I mean, and then you think you're better than everyone because you think that you did it. You are the one who, mashallah, you read and you went to the message. No, no. Allah allowed you to do it. Allah brought you here. And just like Allah gave you the permission to do it, He can change the situation as well. He can change your situation as well. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is narrated that one of the ad'iyah, the most that he would repeat, one of the ad'iyah that the Prophet Sallallahu would repeat the most is Allahumma, ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. O oh, you, O oh, turner of the hearts, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh, turner of the hearts, keep my heart firm in your deen. That's who... Who's making this dua? Who? The Prophet Sallallahu He's been promised paradise. Allah has told him. All your past sins have been forgiven and all your future sins have been forgiven. Guarantee. Still he makes this dua. Did the Prophet Sallallahu need to recite at least 17 times that year can I do Oh, Did the Prophet Sallallahu need to say this? No, because he's already been guided and he's been guaranteed. Yet, he doesn't just say it 17 times, that's because if you add, that's the Fard Salah only. No, no, he prays more. Duha, Oda, Rawatib, Sunan, Nawafil, Qiyamul, you know, and Kam. In every raka'ah, the Prophet says, Ihidina Surat al Mustaqim, Surat al Ladina, and I'm tired of Mayrid Mahu, the Alayhim al Pali. Asking or begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep him firm and steadfast upon his guidance. Jalla wa Ali. That's the Prophet. What about me and you? If that is the Prophet, what about me and you? What about me and you? A question, Ikhwani, we need to remind ourselves of. Now, the Prophet وسلم, enters into this piece of land and he finds refuge, as we said, relaxes. And, like I said, these two brothers who own this land, they let him rest, like I said, the, 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 you know, even though they hate him, there is uh, allegiance in terms of tribal, tribal. Even, well, not just that, but they have a servant known as Addas. And they say, they give him some grapes, and they say to him, give, give this man. So there is a certain level of hospitality as well, yani, mashallah. So this young servant brings the grapes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam takes one, says Bismillah and eats. 
Now the servant is surprised. And he says to the Prophet what's this? These, I've never heard these people in, talking about you know, the Arabs. None of them have said this word. What is this? What is this? And the Prophet وسلم, describes it to him. And says to him, ask him, where, where are you from? He said the name I does. Where, where are you from? And he says, I'm from Ninawa. City called Ninawa. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, oh, that's the city of uh, my brother Yunus. <coughs> the Prophet Yunus ﷺ. Now, this man is baffled. Baffled. How, how do you know about Yunus? He says, how do you know about Yunus? Because this man, Adas, is from the city Ninawa. Yunus the Prophet, is from this city. And so naturally, he knows about Yunus but how would a person in the middle of the desert, no civilization, middle of the desert, you know, barbarians, if you want to call it, nothing, no civilization. So this man, he's Christian, he's thinking, how on earth does this man know about Yunus alayhi salam? There's no way, there's no chance this man living in the middle of the desert would know anything about, or we don't, we don't, would even know this name. Yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi tells him, this is the city of my brother Yunus. My boy says, how, how, how do you know about Yunus? The Prophet وسلم, says, he was a prophet. See, Adas didn't tell him that Yunus is a prophet. The Prophet وسلم, is, even though he knows, Adas knows. And so, <coughs> the Prophet وسلم, says, Yunus, my brother, was a prophet, and I am a prophet. So he's my brother. He's my brother, he's my brother because he was a prophet, and I'm a prophet. And straight away, Adas kisses the Prophet وسلم, in the forehead, kisses his hand, and kisses his feet. And on the spot, takes his shahada. On the spot, becomes a Muslim and says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Now, these two brothers are watching. They're watching him become a Muslim. When he comes back, uh, the servant Adas comes back to them. What were you doing? Kissing the man's feet. Why? And he says to them, He told me something only a prophet would know. He told me something only a prophet would know. And so they turn to him and they say to him, By the way, they are the masters, he is a servant, right? And so they say to him, Ah, careful. Yeah, careful so he doesn't make you change your religion and the, and, and in a very stern way and at this point he clocks uh, if I was to tell him no I followed him if you become Muslim he's in trouble so he's just alright he keeps it to himself he keeps it to himself now it's narrated that the Prophet وسلم, at this point Jibreel السلام, comes to him Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam at this point. Again, bear in mind, he's still beaten up, you know, he's just about finding some rest, still bloodied up and all of that, in pain, physically hurt, emotionally hurt, he's in a, he's in a state, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to him and he says to him, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, we have heard what your people have said to you. And here with me is the angel of the mountain. Give him the order. Just, just say it. And he will crush these two mountains, uh, the, the city in between these two mountains. Just, just, just give him the word. I will straight destroy these people for good. Now, put yourself in his shoes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If that was you, what would you do? For sure you would take revenge. And a half. They destroyed them. They don't have anyone. Anyone who even mentions them. Anyone around. Everyone. You would go far. We do, we do much for less than that. Huh? Be it because someone looks at you, oh, you're really shocking me, oh, fight. Or oh, he said this on, on social media, oh, he did, eh? for the petty stuff. Major beef over petty stuff. The Prophet وسلم, here in this point, in this situation, he has all the right to take revenge. He has all the right. 
because of what they did to him, he has a right. Because otherwise, if Jibril would not come and brought you, you've gone through that, you know, brought the angel of the mountains, the Prophet has all the right, all the right to take revenge. But instead, the Prophet وسلم, says, No. Because I hope, or perhaps, there will be people from their offspring, those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not associate partners with him. Perhaps they will be from their offspring, people who say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And that is what we see today. Look at Taif. Muslims. Muslims. And so, Ikhwani, the lesson here is, don't let the situation overwhelm you. Don't let the moment overwhelm you. And let your emotions take over. La. Always be level-headed. Always be level-headed. And let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam be the judges of your affairs. So judge your affairs, your situation according to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And act accordingly. Now I'm not saying do nothing and just be passive. Huh? Uh, and just be, you know, like they say, you know, if the slap left, let you give him the other cheek. La la la, we don't have that in our deen. In Islam there's no such thing. They have in their religion, that's why they get slapped up and every two minutes they change their opinions. Huh? We don't have that in our deen. We don't compromise like that in our deen. You slap, you get slapped back. Like, I'm not saying go slap everyone you slap. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not uh, inciting violence. I'm just saying in terms of uh, justice. Right? In terms of justice. Tamam, as an ummah, is not, we don't have that concept. Right? However, what I'm saying here, Rikhwani, is don't act on emotion. Don't let the situation overwhelm you. So that you lose focus, you become demoralized, disheartened, oh, it's too much, and they do look, look at them, and you start getting like, you know, overwhelmed. Oh, look, you can't do anything now, you can speak up, and look what happened. They, this, they, you know, they're lobbying, they take, anyone, you know, he loses his job because he said something. Oh, they're watching us all the time, and this, you start getting all, you know, next level. Uh, they're always watching, you start getting paranoid, you know, you start buying a brick phone again. You, you remove yeah, all that next level stuff, huh? You go, they're watching the camera, you cover it uh, on the laptop, the webcam, you, you start getting all full on para. You understand? Every night you just switch everything off, Wi Fi, maybe they hear me, they listen to me. Come on, that's, that's too much, too much because you're, you're not going to live then. You go, you're going to lock yourself up in a room, and just, you're just mental. And then everyone, oh, you see that sign, you flip it over, you look at it like that from the mirror, you see, you see oh, it's their sign. And you look at the cloud, you, you will go lost. You'll get lost. You, you, oh, it's in the taps, it's in the water, they put something there, it's in the medicine. You, you won't trust nobody. You won't trust nobody. You will just become a recluse, recluse. stay at home. And everyone is, everyone is out for you. You're the number one top list wanted. Huh? Number one, yeah, he, they're looking after you. Everyone, are looking for, everyone is looking for you. Someone looks at you like a little bit too long. Ah, he's one of them. Yeah, he's one of them. Like, you paranoid, and then you, you run back home. Khalas, you, you live on. Uh, uh, Allah, this is true. Some people are doing this. Some people, Muslims. I'm not talking about kuffar. They have their own theories and all nonsense that they do. I'm talking about Muslims. So, you know, next level paranoid or buy long life stuff. You know, stock up. Because you know they will take everything over and then this and that and they put everything no no it's not long life stuff buy you know get ready for I don't know how am I get up some next level stuff it's, just, it's really stupid you just stock up you know how they have a bunker have this and that next level next level Muslims and where is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Yani He will just let them do everything that Yani where is Allah You have taken these people to the level of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala they have everything they see everything. And Allah is not, is not there. Allah is not there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and this ayah, ikhwani, is an ayah we should write down and keep it with us all the time, so this, especially this time. Especially at this time. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ Don't... Uh, Think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware of the, what the oppressors are doing. Don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not watching and not knowing. Where, Allah has gone on holiday, 
Allah's not there now, he's taking a break. No, Allah is there, watching, knowing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ They plot and they plan, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans. وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرُ is an ayah of Ani, Walat Sabana Allah Hafil and Amma Yamal of Bali Moon. In Nama, you are Kiru, the Yom in Tashkos of Hil Absar. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware of what the oppressors are doing. But He's, you know, planning for them a day, wait, you know, he's, he's letting them go so that one day will come when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them. There will come a day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them. What happened to Pharaoh? What happened to Pharaoh? Allah dealt with him. Through the hands of Banu Israel? No. He dealt with him himself. Namrud, the king who threw Ibrahim alayhi salam in the fire. Allah dealt with him in the most humiliating way. All these Jababir, all these uh, you know, tyrants who lived in the past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with them himself. Himself. Jalla wa ala. So don't worry. Never ever feel that oh, we are lost, we can't do anything. No, never. 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 Because as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, The end of the victory will be for al muttaqin What we have to make sure is that we are from these muttaqin You, as a Muslim, have to make sure you're on the right side. Because when push comes to shove, when the time comes, there will be two camps. No, three. Huh? No, I'm just on the bench, substitute, I'm watching. No. There's no such thing then. When the time comes, Either you will be a victorious group or you will be with other group. You are going to be in one of them. Either you will be for or you will be against. There will be no, I'm just sidelined, I'm just on the wall. La. Because there's no such thing as, you know, uh, what these votes they have nowadays, withdraw and all that. I mean, nah, nah. There's no such thing when it comes to this time. Because now it's gone too far. It's gone too far now. Now we're coming towards. Towards the end. Towards the end. When the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely come down to this ummah. And what we have to do is make sure that we are on the right side of the fence, if you want to call it that. Tayyip. And so, Ikhwani, again, we digressed quite a bit there. I do apologize. Uh, but going back to the story, the Prophet, وسلم, as I said, said to Jibreel alayhi salam, no, perhaps, or I hope there will be, from the offspring people who say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, change the situation. It's up to Allah, it's not me and you. It's not me and you. Right? What we have to do is change what's within ourselves. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah will not change the situation of, the, of, a, of a nation until they change what's within themselves. So if you rectify your relationship with Allah, leave the rest to Allah. Allah will sort it out. Allah will sort it out. Then the Prophet ﷺ returns back to uh, Mecca. And at this point, of course, sad and disappointed. What time, time is Isha, by the way? Half seven. Half seven. What time is it now? Quarter past. We'll finish off before Salah, Isha. Now, another event that happens, another major event that happens, and Again, we will take lessons from this event related to what is happening today, inshallah ta'ala. Two years, according to some scholars, before Hijrah. Some scholars say one year before Hijrah. Okay, so there's a difference of opinion as to when it happened. Either it happened two years before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, or it happened one year before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Al Medina. And this event is known as Al Isra' wal Mi'raj. Al Isra' wal Mi'raj. Isra is the traveling of the Prophet ﷺ during the night from Mecca to, to where? Where the sleeping? To Bayt al-Maqdis, okay, Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, right? <coughs> specifically next to the masjid in that area, okay? Masjid al-Aqsa, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to free them. Ameen. Okay. And Al-Isra is the ascension. The Prophet ﷺ ascending from Bayt al-Maqdis to uh, the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted this to the Prophet ﷺ, as some scholars mention to 
grant the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, uh, strength, comfort, right? Because as I said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now come back from Taif, very difficult time. Uh, you know, the torture of, of Quraysh is intensifying, very difficult time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is feeling a bit weak, right? So the Prophet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grants him this journey, okay? This is a journey that we will, inshallah, cover and we will see how this became a means of, of strength for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, Subhana Ladi Asra bi Abdihi Laylam min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa Ladi Barakna Hawla. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Exalted is he who took his servant, referring to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sallam, by night from Masjid al Haram, Mecca, to al Masjid al Aqsa. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay, or this area. He says, Jalla wa ala, Allah di barakna hawla. Okay. Whose surroundings we have blessed. So this land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us about it in the Quran. It is a blessed land, Nikwani. It is a blessed land. Now, this journey starts off in Mecca. And as the narrations mentioned, Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, opens up his chest, uh, and we've mentioned this before, takes out his heart, like he did when the Prophet sallallahu was only five or six years old. <coughs> takes out his heart, cleans it in a plate of, or in a bowl of, uh, of gold with zamzam water. Okay? With uh, zamzam water. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, is taken, major surgery here, yeah? open heart surgery. طيب. The Prophet ﷺ is taken with what is what became known as al-Buraq. Okay, Buraq. And this animal is uh, smaller than a horse, but bigger than a, a donkey. So almost like a mule, okay, but we don't know for sure. So something like a mule, okay. And the Prophet ﷺ is taken on uh, this, this beast, uh, and taken to uh, Al Quds. All this, by the way, happened in one night. All this happened in one night. Uh, and there is difference of opinion with regards to uh, whether the Prophet was taken, as in physically, or whether it was a dream and he was soul. The correct opinion as the Prophet is the Prophet was taken physically. Okay, that he was taken physically, because it's what is understood as well later on when the Prophet comes back and tells the Quraysh that this is what happened, okay, they could have just, oh yeah, it's a dream, and, and allowed it. Well, it's a big deal. Anybody could dream. I've been to Mars in my dream. Yeah, you say anything in your dreams. And they could even use that argument against him. So, hey, we've been seeing stuff in your dreams, bro. You're right. But the Prophet ﷺ said, I went. And so, he, sp he said this to Abu Lahab, first, one of the leaders of Quraysh, and he was like, what, you what? You did what? And he was like, come, come, come. Tell these people, okay? Tell the leaders of Quraysh so they can mock the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? So it wasn't, because if it was just a dream, they wouldn't have made a big deal out of it. Like, yeah, yeah, so what? It's a dream. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying, no, I went. And there are other things as well. You know, he mentioned the Jibreel took me by hand, he took my hand, okay? Indicating that he was his actual hand, etc. And the other things as well. So the correct opinion is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken physically in this journey. And on this journey, uh, and some scholars say either on the way to Bayt al-Maqdis or on the way back. So he's been to the heavens, come back, and he's now coming back to Mecca. Okay? Either or. He's uh, shown us, you know, you know, a few things. He's shown uh, a number of things. An old woman wearing uh, beautiful ornaments, old man on the side trying to tell him to stop. Uh, you see people swimming uh, in blood, uh, bathing in blood. You see people ripping their face, uh, cheeks with uh, iron rods, etc. Uh, so a few things that he sees on the, on, on, uh, on the way and each and every one of these have, has a story in and of itself, okay? But that's not something that we want to go into because of, because of time, right? 